Joining me right now is Senate Finance Committee member, Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. And Senator, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Maria, thank you for having me. Your thoughts ahead of this summit? Um, historic. Can't we? Can you imagine a mama, a mother whose child is on the front line with North Korea, just praying for an outcome that would make that her child would be safe, and all the South Koreans? So it's historic. We have to hope and pray for its success. It is. Is success nothing short of denuclearization, or is there a process to get to denuclearization? Clearly, there needs to be a process to get there, but success ultimately will be judged by history by denuclearization. There are, Seoul, South Korea is only 60 miles from North Korea. As long as you can destroy Seoul, there is an existential threat to the West. Korea being part of the West, if you will. So, yes, denuclearization, not necessarily at the summit, but in the long term. This president has been making some bold calls, wh whether it is meeting with the president or the head of North Korea, to moving the embassy to Jerusalem, to pushing back on China. What are your thoughts on the president's agenda so far? Uh, the president not only will break an egg, he'll take a whole carton of eggs and he'll slam them up and down. And then he'll say, you need to crack some eggs to make an omelet. <laughs> and he'll scrape it. Yeah. But the fact that he has been so aggressive with North Korea, clearly has worked. The secondary sanctions where you've cut off North Korea from the entire banking system has brought them to the point where they will negotiate. And if they'll negotiate a way for denuclearization, and as Secretary Pompeo says, as if they can be reassured that it will end well for them, then the world will breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah, but what are your thoughts on what's going on with trade right now? I mean, everyone we're speaking with on, on this program certainly keeps questioning why we are, uh, are fighting with Canada, where we actually have a trade surplus. Yeah. So first, I'll say that we've got to protect American jobs. Um, there's stevedores in Louisiana and farmers in Louisiana who very much benefit from international trade. That said, put it in context. After World War II, the United States created a global trading system, which we protect. We allowed other countries to have favorable negotiating terms with us to rebuild Western Europe, rebuild Japan, all to hold off the threat of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is gone. Russia is fading. And so now do we continue need to spend entirely for that defense? Do we need those countries to have an advantage to us relative for trade? Probably not. There probably needs to be a little bit of a redo. So you're saying we put ourselves at the losing end of a lot of these deals after World War II. This was by, des by design. By design. Yeah. And it worked. But now we're 50 years later. Yes. And things now, plus 50 years later, and, and things should change. So look at this. Um, um, in NATO, countries are supposed to spend a certain amount of their GDP on defense. It's supposed to be 2% for Germany. Germany spends 1.2 or 1.4%. Jim Mattis, our Secretary of Defense, went there and said, Americans cannot care more about the defense of Europe than do Europeans. So That's why doesn't point, Germany yeah. spend a little bit more? Uh, and frankly, Germany does have some advantageous trading terms with us. Yeah. And so I think it probably is time for a little bit of a redo. I understand all that, but what about Canada? Yeah. What's the problem with Canada? We have a surplus in Canada. Uh, so Peter Navarro had an editorial this past weekend in the New York Times in which he spoke of, uh, for example, tariffs that they put on our dairy products so that farmers in Wisconsin cannot send their goods across the border. Uh, so obviously there's isolated examples. Even though we have a surplus, there are isolated examples where they're charging us. Apparently from the perspective of the administration. Understood. All right, let, me, let, me, let me turn to uh, health care. Obviously, when you tried to get health care done earlier in the year last year, you got a big thumbs down uh, from one of your colleagues. Where do we stand in terms of uh, changing the health care in America. We've got to make health care more affordable. We've got to lower the cost of drugs. And that's not just important for families and for states. It's also important for Medicare, which the trust fund will be bankrupt somewhere around 10 years from now, eight years from now. How do we lower drug costs? Uh, how do we make things more affordable? One thing we're promoting is price transparency. Imagine, Maria, you go to the doctor, he orders or she orders a CT scan. You know the price before you go, as opposed to get a bill six weeks later. It's what we do for cell phones and what we do for jeans. So we're promoting price transparency to lower those costs to make things like drugs and other procedures more affordable. Why, why would that be, you know, such an... Uh, why aren't we doing that already? I don't understand why this is even an issue. Of course you want to know what something costs before you go book it. Isn't that true? But if somebody's opposed to price transparency, they're probably making money. And if you let the consumer know what she's about to buy, maybe they don't make as much money. 
Mm -hmm. And there'll be all kinds of reasons why you can't do it. Ultimately, though, the patient should have the power of knowing the price. So can you legislate that? So there are some ways you can. For example, there's a gag clause that forbids a pharmacist from telling a patient that it might be cheaper for her to pay cash than to pay her insurance deductible. Think about that. The mm -hmm. pharmacist, by contract, cannot tell the patient it's cheaper to pay cash. We can get rid of that. Wow, that's incredible. All right, let me switch gears and ask you about the Department of Justice's Inspector General report. The IG report set to come out on this Thursday, June 14th, and this, of course, report will detail the FBI's handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation. Senate Judiciary Committee member Senator Lindsey Graham previewed some of the questions that he will have when Michael Horowitz sits for that testimony in front of his committee. Here's what he said. Do you believe the way the FBI handled the Clinton Clinton email investigation, it was on the up and up. Do you believe it was fair? Do you believe uh, they were in the tank for Clinton and hated Trump? Was it really a serious investigation or was it a politically compromised? As to the FISA warrant, do you believe it was appropriate for the Democratic Party to hire a foreign agent to go to Russia to get dirt on candidate Trump and the FBI and the DOJ use that dossier that's never been verified to get a warrant against an American citizen? I want to hear him say one way or the other whether or not the Clinton email investigation was professionally done on the up and up and how he, what he thinks about the FISA warrant. So Lindsey Graham joined me on Sunday Morning Futures on Fox News yesterday, and he said to me he believes laws were broken. What are your thoughts? I don't know if laws are broken or not, but I think it's important for the American people to know. And this Inspector General report will get there. What Senator Graham asked are great questions. Ultimately, the American people don't want FBI to be politicized. They want it to be objective. And at, at, if you will, an issue now is where the objective. So, I mean, we, we've seen the text from Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. We know they were not objective. Did that go into the handling of the actual investigation is the question. Totally. I mean, we, as well we know as, a lot of them were already biased. We know the answer to that. Yes, as well as Andrew McCabe, whose wife had a, uh, if you will, some sort of relationship with the Democratic governor of Virginia. Who gave her $700,000 for her Senate run. On the other hand, I am willing to concede that maybe the FBI agents had a certain bias in terms of whom they voted for, but nonetheless they were able to approach as professionals the investigation on an objective fashion. So Lindsey Graham is not presupposing answers. He is posing questions that if the answer is satisfactory, he's okay, so, as am I. And, and, and the IG report, if there are criminal charges recommended the way they were in the earlier report, what does that mean? It means that they were not professionals and rather they were carrying out a political agenda. I'm not going to presume that, but that is what the American people are waiting to see. All right, we will be watching that. Senator, it's good to see you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bill Cassidy joining us there.